Thank you, David, for the introduction and the invitation to come and visit your group. So I'm going to talk about my postdoctoral research, which I did at EMBL. And it's based on a new method that was developed um, to investigate protein turnover. And we all know that science is driven by technology. Uh, here, the prototypical example or the image we all think of when we think of this is the, the telescope. So here is Hevelius circa 1670, and he used uh, one of the first prototypes to, to look at lunar bodies. He discovered four new comets, comets, and that was really huge at the time. But technology moves forward, so we have the same method, but only a couple of years ago, we have Hubble Extreme Deep Field. So here you can see approximately 13.2 billion years, uh, years ago, essentially. Um, so you can really almost see back to the Big Bang, which is incredible. So technology moves us forward at a rapid pace. Now, while we don't exactly have a Hubble Extreme Deep Field, uh, we have um, a new tool. So the idea is that you take a protein and you tag it with two fluorophores. So this was thought of by Mikhail Knopf's group at, um, in Heidelberg, and they started thinking about uh, fluorophore kinetics. And they, they, they noticed that if you consider different fluorophores, and you just imagine a, a pool of proteins, let's say, with, with this tag, what would happen would be one color would come up maybe rather quickly. Typically, for example, the GFB with the fluorescence would come up within this pool quite quickly because it folds up faster. Whereas maybe a red fluorescent protein might come up a bit slower. And of course here, eventually you have a ratio which increases and eventually reaches one. So you have all these proteins and they all have fluorescent ORFPs and GFPs, which by itself isn't super interesting, but you can see that here there, there's, there's kinetics, there's a time scale. So they wondered, what if we put this on uh, proteins in the cell? Well, what would happen? So here, we don't just have one pool of proteins. We rather have a, a constant production of proteins, in, if you, in, at least as a simple model. And you have uh, degradation all the time. So here's, here's a simple model uh, where you have proteins being produced, degraded, and you have the two fluorophores being matured at different rates. Remember that the, the GFP is fast and the ORFP is slow. So they put this into a model, an ODE model, and they, they asked what would happen in steady state. So once the system gets a, finds a balance between the production, the degradation, and the maturation rates, and so on, what do you have in the end? And it turns out that you get a measure which is independent of production, it cancels out, Think about this, it intuitively makes sense when you take the ratio of the signal from the, the, the two fluorophores. What you're, what you're left with is a quantity which is a function of the maturation rates of the two fluorophores, the MOR and the MG. Remember that these are constant, you, you always use the same fluorescent proteins, and typically in the, the one experiment. And then you have degradation rate K. Now if you, if you take the uh, uh, natural log of 2 divided by k, this gives you the half-life. So you can see that as the ratio increases, um, or as the half-life of the protein increases, so does the ratio. So this gives us a quantitative readout for turnover, essentially, which is really great. So one of the first thing, first questions they decided to investigate uh, with this, so Mikhail Knopf's group is a yeast lab, and one of his PhD students, Anya Bartosik, she decided to look at what's called the end-end rule, and, and that's quite interesting. So it turns out if you look at the last two amino acids on the end terminus of a protein, this can really determine the half-life of that protein. If there are no other degradation signals being given off, it can really change the half-life from minutes to hours or, or even longer. It's quite incredible. So there is a technique out there, pioneered by Varshavsky, where you can you can produce a construct within the cell you can, you can, uh, where ubiquitin will be automatically heaved off when you have two amino acid choices. So they, what they did was they created lots of strains where they had different amino acid combinations on the end terminus. And they simply wondered um, which, which proteins are associated with the degradation of the substrates depending on this amino acid sequence. So there's some information known about this already. So, um, uh, we have some idea what to expect, and we wondered if we would also find new things. So Anya created a high-throughput platform where she crossed with the gene deletion collection um, to, to screen really in high-throughput. 
So the data looks like this. You, you, you have a, a, a plate of yeast colonies here. In this case, is a, a plate of 1,536 um, spots. Each, each circle here is a yeast colony, which has millions of cells. And so you're getting a real bulk average fluorescence readout in each of these spots. And in each of these spots is a different um, gene deletion. So this is what it looks like. We put it into a plate reader. It scans over all the colonies. It tells us the fluorescence readouts, spits it out as, a, as an Excel sheet. And so we, we, we look at where the colonies are. Uh, we, we make sure the annotation is correct. And then, then we look at the fluorescence intensities and calculate the ratio and, and look to see which strains are most affected. So what we found here, so here we look at, um, we can use the GFP, so just one fluorescence readout as a, as a measure for abundance, simply. And mm -hmm. if you have the ratio, you have this, this measure of protein half-life or stability. And so what you see here are, are points which jump out from the main cloud, are, are um, substrates, substrates which became more abundant and lived longer when these deletions uh, were, were in place. So uh, we had a, a mixture of things that were already known to be substrates for different amino acid combinations, and we also found some new stuff. So this was essentially a proof of principle that we could use this to find new biology. Um, so the, are the red ones the no, that were known from before? Or? So red, red was, was known, and, and the, the, the black was, okay. was, yeah. was unknown. So pretty much the guidelines proteins that have uh, the mobility and the Oh, I mean, that, that always happens for all of these, so, um, because you need for these two amino acids to be exposed for the machinery to really come in. So you, you can more or less dissect the, the, the degradation pathway, um, which we, to some extent we were, we were able to do by just looking at heat map clustering here. So we were able to, to, to group together um, uh, gene deletions, which are in the, in the same pathway, and also um, amino acid combinations, which resulted in, in also Similar, similar effect here. So kind of encouraged by this, um, this study that we could really use high throughput screening with this method, um, Mikhail's group went on to, to really try and create a, a new library where um, you take the whole proteome and you, ta you create a new strain for each protein where each protein is tagged endogenously with, this, with the timer. Um, so they went through some basic steps to, to, to make sure that we avoid tagging proteins which, which might have problems, which might severely bias the, the, the ratio because in the end of the day, this is still fluorescence microscopy, fluorescent proteins have their limitations. We decided not to tag um, uh, proteins that were known to localize to really extreme subcellular locations within the cell, over here. Which uh, would, would skew the readout. Uh, uh, they also decided uh, not to tag proteins which they knew had really strong C terminus degradation signal um, because they, they, they put the tag at the C terminus. Um, and then they, they yeah, they, uh, if, if the protein wasn't expressed in log phase, they also didn't tag. So in the end, we have about 4,000, uh, 4,044 to be exact, pr uh, proteins which were, were tagged. And, which may constitute now this library. And this is really ongoing work, so most of this stuff has not been published. So um, we're still working on a lot of things. So I'm not going to show you all of the biological results today, but rather give you some overview and the taste for how the analysis has gone and what we're starting to get out of this method. Uh, so they, they tried growing on different media. Um, they tried, um, they actually, Anton Klemensky, who really was behind all of this work, did a huge amount of work. He went to Charlie Boone's lab in Toronto to um, do a really, really big screen where they, they crossed this library with uh, a set of gene deletions associated with the ubiquitin cortisone system. And um, in Heidelberg, there's been some groups in the same institute who got quite interested. They're interested in misfolded proteins, acetylation, so they, all, they have smaller, more targeted screens where they're trying to uh, address different questions. So just as a kind of a, an overview, here would, be, here would be an example of an experimental design. So here is the 1536 well plate, just as a, as a cartoon. 
So um, we observed that yeast colonies have um, growth effects on, on the corners where they have less competition for nutrients. So they actually grow, grow bigger so to buffer the readouts which we want. Um, just a dummy uh, borders where, where, uh, where you have just colonies which don't express the timer. They're just, uh, they're just normal colonies. They have some autofluorescence. Uh, they're placed around the edge. Um, and, and we also wanted to have a way to address the problem of having different fluorescence readouts and, and different, uh, different intensities, different gains maybe coming from our reader. Uh, so we wanted to be able to correct for technical differences in fluorescence intensity. So what we decided to do was place uh, the same set of reference colonies on every plate, always the same, thereby allowing us to, to define a constant unit of, of measurement by which we can then compare the fluorescence intensities in different plates. And the actual colonies of interest are all the green guys here. So he, just an example, the, the, the plate reader comes along and, and sometimes it, 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 it decides it, uh, on a, a different gain basically for different plates. Um, so, so here is just um, yeah, sa um, sample wells, the, the green guys in the, in the previous slide for the two different fluorescence channels. Uh, so it dynamically d d chooses this gain, and you can clearly see there's a huge differences which uh, are, have, are technical in origin and need to be corrected for. So what we did is we took these reference colonies, which I told you about in the previous slide, and we looked at these guys, and we, what we simply did was, was shift these, um, the fluorescence intensity for the whole plate um, such that the reference colonies were, always, were nicely lined up and aligned with one another, uh, as you see in the left. And on the right is, is, is the result of this correction. And it was interesting because at first uh, you see this kind of smooth decrease and then a couple of bumps. And I thought that possibly this was also um, a technical effect uh, due to um, conditions while the plates are being imaged. But then I later found out that actually they, they intentionally grouped proteins according to um, abundance as, as, much as, as much as they could. So the first plate had the most abundant proteins and then this decreased and so on. But actually at some stage um, they realized that they, there was an issue with the experimental design that they wanted to change. So they went ahead and uh, re, uh, uh, reassigned um, plates to, or colonies to new plates. And that's the first bump here and they actually needed to do that twice and so you get it. This is the reason for these bumps here. So um, this was I have, Can I ask two questions? Yeah, of course. So, um, on the bottom left panel, reference colonies after correction, yeah. is that the average of the reference colonies across the plate? It's the median. It's the median? Yeah. So, did you also check to look at, say, you know, X, Y position? Yeah. Because since you know you're going to have border effects, just yeah. to check to see whether you have a trend that the um, reference colonies in the middle and the sides have the same um, have the same results. Yeah, we checked. Uh, so it depends. Um, some experiments appear to have very little spatial bias, uh, uh -huh. and then we don't correct. And some some do. So we in that case, what we do is we we, we fit a smooth surface, two dimensional surface, to the plate, and then and then perform a correction. If uh -huh. you remind remind me at the end, I do have an extra slide somewhere, I think. Or I show an example. No, that's okay. Of this. Or just how big are the effects? Yeah. So there were some effects. So you can get you can get some variation by maybe tw uh, up to 20, 30 percent in the signal across the plate. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah. So it, it, it's something we always have to check for. It can definitely. And then happen. in the top left, I mean, it looks like before correction, most of the plates are the same, but then there are a couple that are much lower yeah. GFP. Yeah. Was there something systematically different about those plates? Yeah, so for, for those plates, the, the, what the plate reader does in practice is it, it um, tries and scans over the plate and it tries a high gain and a low gain and then uh -huh. it tries to automatically estimate um, what the best one be or, or an opti optimal gain quite quickly. And sometimes it, it, it I, I don't know what the internal algorithm is, but sometimes it fails to do that so it just defaults then to one of the gains, and in this case the low gain, and so you get a, a, a lower fluorescence intensity. Yeah, so it, okay. it yeah. And it only has two levels. It's either low or high. Low, low or, low or high, no. and then it is. No. Yeah. 
so that's why it's another reason why it was kind of important to try and group to as much as you can um, proteins which have a similar fluorescence intensity because you don't you don't want them to be outside of the dynamic range. Oh, that's right. You want so them on. all within the dynamic range. So that's why Ideally. it was a good idea in the experimental design. Yeah. To group proteins by abundance. Yes, exactly. That was the thinking. Great. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Um. So here's a plot then just of GFP versus RFP. And you can see immediately that this is a problem. So uh, it's, it's slightly <laughs> skewed down towards the, the bottom left. It doesn't really uh, fit so nicely on, on, a, on, a, on a straight trend. Um, and what this quite clearly is, is, is background fluorescence. So it actually, uh, we are quite close to cellular autofluorescence here. So the GFP is not always that much above what the, the, the green light that would be normally given off by the cell. Um, so you know the, the first thing you, you, would, you, would, you would think of doing is just so, so we have um, border colonies which are we, we can estimate this autofluorescence and you can just you know subtract that and, and then uh, set the Na everything which is negative and then redo this plot which I do here but what you see is when you do that is you just blow up the noise massively, um, which is really, really not uh, not ideal. So we'll be hoping to look at ratios, and if, if it's too noisy down the low end, we, we really would have to throw away an awful lot of our data. So we decided this was not optimal. So wh why do you get discrete levels down there? Because the, the numbers are just really, really low uh -huh. from, from the plate reader. Mm -hmm. I mean, you see you have like some really low abundant proteins. Yeah. So even... Um, there, yeah, you just have very small readout from integer readout from, from and the, readout. so the readout is integer. The readout the, is integer. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um. So if you actually do, actually, can you go back one slide? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Just a second. Go again. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right, here we are. Yeah. So, um, the so there the points that are um, say low in GFP and 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 high in RFP. Yeah. Is that is that just that maybe one of the tags wasn't synthesized properly? Like there was an error in the construct and it's not actually making it or maybe not folding. So we we don't think it's that. Um, so I'll show you in a couple of slides. These are all uh, the ones who are which are really high in RFP. These are all associated with uh, a mitochondrial function, and we uh -huh. believe that this is just another. It's an extreme environment within the cell, which is influencing uh, the folding. The, I, I don't know if it's the folding or, or just somehow the brightness. Um, oh, yeah. Uh -huh. But there's something about that uh, subcellular location which it appears to be strongly biasing the fluorescence readout. But these I are. See. You can see that they are really all more or less belonging to the same compartment. Um, so I, I highlight those again in a couple of slides. And on the right-hand side, I mean on the bottom right, there are also some that are then high in GFP and low in RFP. Yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, we uh, we're undecided as of yet if that is another um, bias in in the readout, which maybe uh -huh. isn't truly really reflective of. Um, of the, the true turnover of these proteins, or if they're just like really quickly turning over. Proteins. Which is the which is the one that's supposed to fold first, the R or the G? The G is meant to fold first. The, the G, the so like if so, a high GFP, low RFP would mean that it's a protein with a very short lifetime. I guess is what. Exa you're exactly. Thinking. So these are actually uh, RPS twenty two A and B. Now, huh? whether or not they really turn over super fast. Is uh, something yet to be determined. Whether and then we... some, it actually is much better than I guess I would have thought. Is that neither? It, it looks like you're not getting early saturation of RFP versus GFP. That yeah. the high signal it's really nice and linear. And yeah, it, it, that end also. It's also a bit better than we thought as well. We didn't. Uh, we expected maybe to have a bit more problem. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it's interesting. One thing I, I don't mention in this talk, but there, with this particular GFP, superfolder GFP, I think there may be some issues with with um, 
with, with uh, its degradation that maybe we might have some, it's not effectively degraded and there might be some residual fluorescence in the cell. So it's uh -huh. interesting actually to think what happens to the dynamic range of the ratio. In some respects, it, it just changes our, where we're most sensitive uh, and it might make us a little bit more sensitive in, uh, in an area where we didn't expect to be. So yeah, it's interesting. Um, and, to, and what are those couple proteins at the very right-hand tip of the distribution? The very, very. Uh, are these the ones that are, um, so above uh, log two GP of ten? And, and yeah, yeah well, like that. There's like a, like two or three right at like fifteen, fifteen. Oh, these guys. Uh, I don't recall what these are. And at the bottom left, you know, even though you put the box around it and say, well, we're subtracting off the baseline and gives us more variance. I mean, to me, that still looks really good. That, I mean, really, what's giving mm. the spread there is just that you have the you know discrete integer values because yeah. you're at the very end of the dynamic range. Yeah. So I'll be like, I'll be really impressed if in later slides you're actually able to do something with that. I think. I mean, to me, it seems like more what's going on is that you have multiplicative noise, but then also at the very bottom of the range, additive noise. Yeah. that the intensity is going to be plus or minus one to five units, yeah. and you really can't do better than that. Yeah, right, yeah. Um, we, we still thought we could do a little bit better than, than this. Um, we still thought that this um, additive noise at the bottom was, I mean, it's not, it's not too bad, but we, we thought we could still yeah. do a little bit better. Yeah. But to me, I mean, it looks like a really nice, clean data set. Yeah, yeah. We, I mean, a lot of work went, in, went into this, so a lot of checking and PCR validation. They, and I would say, in general, in the Kiel Knopf's group, they, they are very thorough. They, they take a long time yeah. to do things, and they, they really take their time and do it right, which is, and that is reflected in the data. Yeah, it's the sort of data that, you know, if we had something like this in my group, I'd be a little worried that it looks too good. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but that, <I'll> <laughs> that's, that's a, I'll take that as a compliment. Uh, it's a gone. All right. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Um, so just again, this is the same data, but just really to, to show you what happens when you actually do take the ratio. So you do get this um, kind of skew downwards. So for low low abundance proteins, and um, so I mean, what this what this says, it tells you something functional. Maybe it's super interesting, but. It tells you that in in our in our particular system there was more green autofluorescence maybe than red autofluorescence, um, so you know the question is uh, what's the best thing to do here uh, with respect to addressing this correction, and so what we we decided to do was simply just uh, fit a, a, a fit a smoothing line uh, through the state. So actually here is two replicates now of the same um, uh, the same um, library, and here's the correction done twice, just to show you that it, it's relatively reproducible. Um, so yeah, we, what we decided to do was just do this fit and basically pull these points upwards. Now this looks good, but um, we don't know for sure uh, if uh, whether or not lowly abundant proteins really do uh, turnover maybe a little bit faster, in which case they would have a lower ratio. So um, we completely removed this trend, but with that caveat that um, we don't really know if perhaps the, the correction should be completely flat or not. But we also know that the, that the timer has a dynamic <coughs> range, which should saturate at some point. So we expect, uh, as a first approximation, the maximum should be more or less similar across the top. Um, and so with that argument, we really think that we're much closer to the ground truth after this correction than before. Um, yeah, so just uh, to uh, address Joel's uh, earlier questions a bit more, uh, also looking at the data with the ratio plotted, um, so if you look at these outliers, uh, the ones up top, this, they seem to be massively enriched for the mitochondrial inner membrane electron transport chain. So uh, that appears to be uh, mm -hmm. somehow biasing our, our fluorescent proteins. 
and give us something a massively high ratio. Uh, and then these guys down the bottom, well, their uh, RPS 22 A and B, uh, is this a technical issue or are they just turning over really quickly? We don't know. Um, but that's uh, an overview. Partial cleavage so of, I mean, of the fluoride. Yeah. It's the the GFP m might have some issues with 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 cleavage, where some of it gets left hanging around. Yeah, yeah, and there's something. Yeah, we're, we're looking into more, but it, it in practice it all it seems to do is shift their dynamic range a little bit. Uh, and it will, it will shift to some extent the measure for abundance. Yeah. Possibly, yeah. Um, so to see how well we're doing then, um, so we decided to, I mean, we have abundance data in our GFP. So the first thing to do was to, to assess how we're doing there. So for that, um, we did a few different comparisons. I'll show you one. So here's a 2006 paper from Jonathan Weissman's group uh, where they did flow cytometry and they simply looked at the uh, GFP, again, fluorescence intensity uh, within, within the library that they had. And we seem to correlate pretty well, pretty well with them. So the, the abundance looks good, I would say. So we're quite pleased to, to uh, see that they have an earlier paper as well from 2003, which um, uh, we also compared to, which also com uh, correlated quite well, which was quantitative less things. Um, so that's okay. Now, what about the ratio, this, the, the turnover, right, where, we're, where the novelty of our approach is? Well, we don't really have a gold standard out there where we can say we're doing, you know, we're doing really good or not. Um, but you know you can still look at the data and think, is it reasonable? For and here's just one example. So you can you can take. So here I took uh, Go Slim terms and and I, I picked out uh, groups of groups of proteins which seem to be systematically um, destabilized, so turning over quickly. Um, and here you see stuff like cell cycle um, division and and so on. So this at least seems to uh, pass a sanity check that it seems reasonable, which is good. Um, so, you know, we're still working on this and, and, and looking at the new biology that's coming out. Um, and like I said, I, I, I'm not going to go into all the different projects right now, but I will show you one. Uh, so even though our library is basically unpublished, we recently found ourselves in a race um, with, with a Barcelona group uh, we're also doing proteomics, and and um, they 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 uh, had a very nice story, um, which was very close to publication, which we also had within our data set, and we're looking at, um, and so uh, they were interested in looking at the uh, mechanisms by which this fold of proteins at the inner nuclear membrane were being dealt with. So it turns out that um, the ASI complex. It actually works uh, uh, works together with the enzymes UBC six and seven to uh, degrade uh, proteins at the inner nuclear membrane. Uh, the the library seemed to indicate that because when you deleted those particular um, uh, proteins, the the ASI, ASI complex proteins, you had a lot of um, other proteins which were stabilized, and if you looked at those proteins and uh, you look for an enrichment in their goal terms, you could see that there, a lot of them were associated with the inner nuclear membrane. Um, so we were in a very close race, and uh, this was a, a small slice, but a very interesting slice. And uh, I would say we were very lucky to actually <laughs> rush the paper together, and nature took it um, to our delight and surprise. Um, and so to some extent, part of our library is now being published, although we still have a lot of work to do. So now I'm going, to, oh, I'm not going to switch yet, just one more thing. Um, one thing which, uh, more just on the bioinformatics side, which I found uh, useful to explore 
this data set was um, or shiny. I, I don't know if you know it, it's a, a way to interact with or in the background. And in this case, I used it to create user customizable heat maps so you can select the conditions and the proteins that you like. And um, you know, the biologists that like it, they can just click on and off some boxes and, and really look at the uh, proteins of, of interest to them at any, at any given time. This worked quite well. It, um, I, I would highly recommend it. Okay, so now I'm going to switch uh, topic, but not method. So we use the timer also, the same breast and protein timer, to address a completely different question in developmental biology. So um, this is a uh, Darren Gilmore's group at EMBL and his PhD student, Erda Donner. They study uh, tissue migration in zebrafish. So this is a, a picture of a zebrafish embryo, um, and it shows... Uh, a migrating group of approximately 100 cells which constitute what's called the posterior lateral line primordium and what it does is over the course of a bed of day it migrates from the head of the fish down towards the tail and periodically drops cells from its rear which go on to differentiate into neuromass and eventually little hair-like um, sensory organs. They use it as a model system for tissue migration it's relatively simple, it's easy to image, it's only 100 cells. Um, so they're very interested in this particular um, tissue and how it migrates. Uh, and the mechanism by which it migrates appears to be uh, very much uh, uh, dependent on a receptor, CXCR4B, and um, its signaling ligand, SDF1A. So the ligand is expressed more or less as a constant stripe along the top of the fish and the tissue just migrates along and follows the stripe. Uh, if, you, if you knock out either the ligand or the receptor, the, uh, the tissue just stops moving you know, or it doesn't move in a very persistent way from the left to the right of, of, the, of the fish. Um, other experiments have been done actually, which is quite amazing, where they, they basically uh, um, they cut off this, this line of ligand and the tissue actually turns around and it migrates the other way. So the tissue by itself, I mean, I mean by itself, doesn't have any intrinsic um, directionality, but it's set up and off it goes. So the uh, hypothesis that's been out there is that even though the ligand is more or less expressed as a constant stripe, there might be a gradient of signaling across the tissue itself. And what happens is every time the ligand binds the receptor, it's internalized. And um, so what Darren realized, I think quite cleverly, is that if you, if you look at the uh, half-life or the turnover of the receptor in the membrane, you therefore get a readout for signaling at the level of signaling activity. So we realized that you could tag this receptor with our timer and then look at um, receptor, uh, receptor half-lives and hopefully address this, this question, which has been in the field for some time. So we have here, so uh, turnover is a proxy for signaling activity. So they created a line within the fish where they tagged the receptor, used just a zoom out of the whole embryo. They collaborated very heavily with the Michiel Knops group, the same yeast group, uh, on developing this line. Um, and so they, they really now were in a position to address this question of whether the turnover of the receptor varied um, along that tissue that they were studying. So uh, that's where I came in, and they, they really wanted to only measure fluorescence intensities and, and turnovers on the membrane, um, not within the cell. There were some um, pockets of, of de degradation products within the cells, which they, they didn't want to consider. So uh, I used a or bioconductor image processing toolbox called EB Image um, to follow an image processing pipeline which allowed us to pick out the membrane and, and get a nice smooth segmentation of it to align different uh, tissues with one another and then uh, compute the timer readout as a function of position along this tissue. And so the result is, is shown here on the left. Um, so we could, we could see after, after uh, looking at many, many samples that there was a very clear uh, gradient um, 
which varied along the uh, along the tissue. So at the front of the tissue, um, the ratio was low, indicating that the, the receptor was turning over very quickly. In other words, it was signaling a lot with its ligand, whereas at the rear, uh, the receptor was was turning over much slower. They also just here on the right, they tagged a, a membrane protein, and um, with the timer, it doesn't turn over at all. Um, it's, it's basically flat. It does kick up a little bit at the front. And um, that might be due to the, the fact that the very first um, couple of cells don't, don't really divide, um, which is something that can also actually influence the ratio. But basically, we have a control, which is more or less flat, and um, a gradient then with a, a receptor, which was, which was um, clearly, in comparison, steep. Um, but that's actually not where this story ends. So uh, it also turns out that there's another different receptor called CX07, and that recognizes precisely the same ligand. So you have two receptors competing for the same ligand. And the, the hypothesis that, that has been developed is that this ligand, which sits only at the back of the tissue, it's not really expressed so much at the front, it basically acts as a vacuum cleaner. It sucks up all the ligand. Um, at the rear, and therefore creates this, uh, facilitates this gradient of signaling. And um, so here are some really beautiful experiments that Erica did. Uh, I, I really never actually forget the first time I saw them. Actually, I really think they're fantastic. So um, what she did first was she, she knocked out the, the, uh, this vacuum cleaner ligand, let's say, 607. And it does migrate, but not very efficiently. It stops, uh, stops short, and it has problems. Now, uh, and then what she did is uh, she cut a nerve, which is uh, exterior to the primordium, which also has CXR7. Um, and what it did was it just floats around, and it acts, if you like, as an exterior vacuum cleaner. So the tissue isn't sucking up the ligand from the rear anymore, but the nerve is now sitting right outside it and is performing that same function. And, and what she saw is as soon as the, the nerve, the exterior vacuum cleaner, came into contact with the rear of the tissue, it just took off like a shot and accelerated. Um, so this was just really a creative experiment um, to, to test this, this hypothesis. So just to summarize then, um, what you what you normally have is um, you have uh, so we're looking at CXR four uh, turnover and then normally you have this vacuum cleaner at the at the rear self directed migration because the tissue creates this own gradient itself. When you knock out the the, the vacuum cleaner ligand, you don't have migrate pr um, proper migration anymore, but you can restore it then by with this clever nerve experiment. And we were able to again quantify these samples. We didn't have as many because it was uh, a very technically challenge, challenging experiment to do, but we saw the expected differences between the groups. And so uh, we've also thought a lot um, as a kind of a spin off from, from this work uh, what is the dynamic range of the timer? So here I, I plot the, uh, the ratio, the, the, the readout from the, the, the protein timer, uh, uh, steady state ratios using, using the model that I showed you at the beginning of the talk, the ODE model. And um, what you see when you, you plot the model and you look at it is you realize that if you have a really fast GFP, uh, say five minutes, that's what I used here, uh, the closer the RFP gets to that five minutes in terms of its maturation kinetics, um, you know, the smaller the dynamic range is going to be. So eventually you're going to have just you know, nothing. Uh, whereas if you walk to the right then you, you, and you take the difference, for example, between these two black lines, you, you, you increase then your, um, your readout, your dynamic range for your readout. In fact, you, you do attain a maximum at some stage. Um, so what we thought was, well, if this is true, if it's really true, then if we use, if we use different RFPs, we have different timers, we should see different gradients, and that's what we see. So MK2 is the flat one along the bottom. This is estimated to have a maturation time of around 20 minutes, of, uh, whereas the other two here 
are estimated to have a maturation time of around one hour. Um, so we've looked a bit more in it now, I won't go fully into detail in this talk, but it looks like tag RP and TD tomato on our system have a similar maturation rate that actually also affects the slope. Um, but the, uh, the TD tomato, I think, has more fret with the GFP, which can also affect the slope. So we're looking at all these technical considerations into, uh, uh, that goes into um, detecting differences, in this case, within the tissue. Yeah, so here's what I, I kind of showed you before. So I call it the sensitivity, but really it's just the dynamic range, the difference in the ratio, the difference between these two black lines that I showed you. So if you consider a range of degradation rates or half-life, um, and you fix your, you say, I, well, I pick a super full of GFP with a half-life or a maturation time of five minutes, and then I vary the maturation time of the second floor from the model, uh, then you get a, a maximum in the uh, predicted maximum in the dynamic range you will get um, for that uh, range of degradation rates. Uh, so we think this could be useful for people when they go about setting up their system, maybe if they're interested in using these timers and thinking which floor floors should I choose, and they can use this model then to, to help them along. Um, Yes. <laughs> okay. There we go. Uh, so here is the same thing again. Uh, here I, I, I show um, the optimal or the maximum dynamic range is plotted here as a function of the two maturation times of the two, two floor fours. So typically what someone might do is um, you know, decide on, on an FP1 around five minutes and then try to choose a maturation time for the second floor, for which is close to this black line. Another um, really important consideration, probably not so much for maybe the yeast people, but for developmental biologists who are interested in using this method for looking at systems which happen very early in development of the embryo, uh, maybe uh, event which happens maybe only hours after after the um, post fertilization. Uh, all of our inference from the model that we use assumes that the system is in steady state. In other words, that the the um, proteins, the, the level of the proteins and the fluorescent the uh, levels of the fluorescent proteins have attained a balance between production and degradation and so on. And it turns out that this can really take a while. Uh, to, before it gets to a steady state. In other words, when this red line would, would, would become flat. So here's just an um, um, analytic uh, estimate for how long that would take. Uh, so you take this slow maturing floor for, uh, with a maturation rate of m, and then the degradation rate of your protein, k, and uh, you get this uh, estimate here, which is the dashed line. And if you plot that, um, so you get the, uh, you, you plot time to reach steady state, according to this estimate, is a function of the slow maturing floor for, and the half-life of the, of the protein. You can really see that it, it actually can take quite a few hours. So it's a consideration for a developmental biologist who wants to study fast processes, so things which happen quickly, uh, that they might want to be careful about which, um, slow maturing floor for that they use. So we're also going to put that out and, and hope that this can be useful for calibrating these systems. And so, to conclude, uh, I hope I've convinced you that these tandem fluorescent protein timers are useful to study turnover in a range of systems. Um, in yeast, I, um, you've seen that it can be very useful for identifying novel protein degradation pathways uh, it can also, and in, in, in quite cleverly, used to look at receptor internalization rates in development, and in our case, to look at spatial signaling grades. And you can also use um, some mo uh, mathematical modeling to help use users to set up their system if they want to use these timers. And that's it. So this is Wolfgang Huber's group at a recent uh, retreat in Leipzig in Germany. Uh, in the bottom left is, is a real uh, 
pioneers of this method, Mikhail Knopf and his postdoc Anton Kaminsky. Uh, I'd also like to thank Bernd Fischer, who's a past member of Wolfgang's group, he now has his own PI position at DKFZ and uh, helped a lot with the data analysis with the timers. And also um, Erica Donna and Darren Gilmore, who did all the work on the directional tissue migration. And that's it. Thank you. Any questions? Or? One very basic question. Why does uh, 